we have an hour for public comment, and although we're we're going to be out of time, we're going to take a whole hour for the public comments. The meeting's going to run long. We won't get to everybody, most likely, but we will get through as many people as, as can speak in an hour. I'm reading from an abstract from April 12th from the California Natural Resources Agency and the California Ocean Protection Council, which I've never heard of and probably half the people in here haven't either. Uh, in collaboration with the governor's office, they prepared a 71-page document to help state and local officials prepare for rising seas. The report was created by seven climate scientists, experts. This uh, new analysis is based on ice melt at the Earth's poles. 75% of Californians live in a coastal county. It concludes that the thawing of ice sheets will soon become the primary contributor, not melting glaciers, as we've previously thought. And it says Greenland has enough ice to raise global sea level by 24 feet, and Antarctica, especially western Antarctica, which will impact, impact in California, has enough to lift oceans 187 feet. So a few weeks ago, we just hit 410 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. So now I'm going to segue into my editorial comments. Unfortunately, without the support of our government or the news media, I don't see any massive curtailment of our greenhouse gases producing, our greenhouse gas producing lifestyle by the federal government, private industry, or the general population, which means this sea level catastrophe might even be happening sooner than these reports are telling us you know, about. First of all, I'd like to comment to uh, our NRC guests. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I wish you were here at every public meeting. Uh, the CEP has done a really good job of, uh, of bringing the public attention uh, throughout the country about nuclear waste. As we know, there may be four or five more nuclear power plants decommissioning this year. So while this meeting is important, and as Glenn Pascal said earlier, we would be much sadder without it because we'd have no place to gripe. But if the NRC wants to uh, see how meetings could possibly work better, I think this type of meeting is very important. But I think a real community engagement panel run by the communities is much more important uh, because we cannot just be confined by structure all the time. Structure can be designed to stop communication and only to be giving a particular point of view. So real discussions in the community, uh, CEP panels in the future for other uh, cities, it might be much, much more advantageous to have a decision-making power uh, by that body set by the community. Uh, and the other thing, when I was visiting with Pear and Dr. Singh uh, two years ago, uh, I was ready to drive away with a used canister. I, they were such good salesmen. Uh, but then I was listening to uh, Dr. Singh and he said, there's a lot of profit to be made. When I think of the environment, I think there's a lot of profit to be made in cleaning it up. And I'm not sure that I want to put nuclear waste in the hands of people that are only thinking about profit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comment, Gene. Good evening. I had a speech prepared, and there are so many things going through my mind right now. I just have to speak my mind and let you know that I've been pretty critical of this CEP because it's one-sided in the sense that we're not hearing from independent nuclear experts. We're hearing a very convincing, persuasive argument to do exactly what Edison wants, and we are getting no solid answers on very critical issues. Like, I'll bring up two that were over a year long. I wanted to know what are the what are the responses we're going to have if we have a criticality event in either the spent fuel pool where something goes nuclear reactive or in a dry cast storage and I want to know what we're prepared in order to prevent it. I think there's too much emphasis on how we're going to get this out of here 
you're playing on our fears to want this out of here immediately and rush to judgment without uh, peer review from people that we trust. Because I've said it before, I'll be brief, but the history with the NRC and Edison is horrible. You guys approved so many terrible things when the plant was operating. You almost caused us to have a nuclear meltdown from all the steam generator problems. You didn't listen to us then. You didn't listen to the whistleblowers that told us that was going to happen. And then it happened. And you're talking at night like you're, you have some view into the future where nothing's going to go wrong. Things go wrong. Things go wrong in WIP, right? I didn't hear anything about WIP's failure. And then, you know, we talk about educating the public. This is not educating, this is getting a sales job. I would not buy a car from you, I'm sorry, but I have the documents that show Holtec, a uh, little semantics game there. You were fined $2 million for the bribery attempt, and uh, TVA did their good job to catch you at that, and you were disbarred for a period of time. And then you got this massive contract, you know? That's a good deal. Two million bucks, that's a good investment. You got how much? 33 million following that, or more than that, right? It's just obscene that we're listening to for-profit only, and we're not getting independent experts telling us that, you know, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't rush to take these steps, and I don't even pretend to know what the right steps are. All I know is the people that helped us through the steam generator project are not being consulted now. And I think the $2 million that Dr. Singh said he would pay if we proved that he was lying, which I think I have the documents right here that prove you're lying, except it's an administrative fee instead of a fine. You take that $2 million and you fund an independent panel of experts that we trust and we'll get some answers that we need right now before we make a critical mistake. I'm okay. tired of this. You guys are reckless and you're misleading the good people at CEP because we don't have that extra input. So let's get on it. Let's do it right. We're Wait. setting the example for the nation. We got to get this right. Thank you very much for your comment. Hi, my name is Charles Langley. I'm with Public Watchdogs, and I would like to cede my time, uh, Mr. Palmasano, to Angela Mooney DRC from the Juan Nino Band of the Ahashiman Nation. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I'm here on behalf of Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples. I live in LA, so it took me a billion hours to get here. And um, I wasn't here at the beginning of the meeting, but I'm told that. Someone said that the Native nations for whom this area is significant have been consulted, and that's actually not the case. I was on the phone with the attorney for San Luis Rey Nation earlier today, and I was just at the house of the tribal manager for the one in Uban, Mission Indians, Ahashima Nation, and I have these letters here today um, from them, and also a letter from Sacred Places Institute requesting government-to-government uh, -government consultation with the appropriate bodies. So clearly, if that consultation had happened, if any sort of meaningful outreach had happened, then I wouldn't be standing here with letters signed by these Native nations requesting government-to-government -government consultation. Additionally, I do just want to highlight the fact that um, while um, recent our Western archaeological science dates our um, existence here at about 15,000 years, you may be aware that there was a recent report from National Geographic that just came out a couple weeks ago that um, found uh, human etchings on mammoth bones that then places our time here at about 150,000 years. And so specifically when you're talking about something like nuclear waste storage, I, 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 it behooves you to engage with the only people here in this place that have an extensive period of time here that post-dates the amount of time that that nuclear waste is going to be harmful, right? You need to engage with and consult with the local Native nations, and it's just shameful that despite the fact that these governments have been in existence for thousands and thousands of years, there's no representation of either Hashiman or San Luis Rey Luceno people on the community engagement panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is my first time ever coming to one of these, and it's been very eye-opening, and it's, there's a relative calm amongst the panel, and I find it a little bit frightening. Um, sorry, first time. Bob, yes. both the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Um, there are uh, documented accounts of Holtec canisters developing cracks at other locations around the world. And my question to Pierre is, what is the seismic rating of a partially cracked canister? And um, then uh, the slides that Tom Palmasano shared showing the weights, uh, the mass of the canisters being loaded and how the, the canisters that are currently being loaded uh, or plan to be loaded weigh so much that they can't be transported by rail. Uh, what we didn't hear is that uh, if you only loaded those canisters with half the number of fuel rods, they would be transportable using the current rail system. And another thing we didn't hear is that if you didn't fully load the canisters, the Tasks, they would actually cool more quickly and become transportable sooner. So I'd like to ask, have we considered only partially loading casks and having more casks? Or did you just decide to go with the maximum capacity for some other reason? And uh, I want to restate uh, what Gary Hedrick stated, and that was the uh, whoever spoke on the whip facility, and uh, they spoke of it as if it's one-third full, and, and it kind of sounded like it's receiving waste, but there was a nuclear accident there that contaminated the interior of the WIP facility, and it's not presently receiving waste, and it would have been nice if the person who spoke about that would have been forthcoming and shared that with us. And uh, my final comment is that the USGS in 2015 acknowledged that the risk for an earthquake in Southern California, an 8.0 or higher magnitude quake for Southern California in the next 20 years is more likely than not. If that more likely than not should happen in cal calendar year 2017, what does any of what you shared today matter? Thank you. Can you just say, since you, since you talk about Southern California, can you just quickly, Bob Pope, tell us what do you mean by Southern California? Because it really matters which fault system we're talking about, as you know. I, I understand that the USGS didn't acknowledge a, individual fault systems. Collectively, the fault systems in Southern California, more likely than not for an 8.0 or greater magnitude quake in uh, the next 20 calendar okay. years from the 2015 study. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to make sure the record was clear about what you said. Kevin Higgins. When I'm curious to know how is it possible that if I go to Disneyland and I can't smoke a cigarette, they'll arrest you basically for having a cigarette on there, how can you bury, what is it, 300,000 pounds of nuclear waste at a facility where you have 8.5 million people, no evacuation plan in place, I mean we know that, for, for, <laughs> all you have to do is look at the fire that took place there, I think it was two years ago, down by San Onofre and the traffic that backed up on the freeway, the five going each direction. You couldn't get out. There's no emergency plan in place, and you know that. I mean, if there was a nuclear accident, when would the public know? That's one of the biggest concerns that I have. Because if you live directly downwind, and the winds are blowing, and they go over the mountains of, uh, um, what's the place? Sorry. Camp, Camp Pendleton, and then down to Temecula, you've wiped out that whole area. I mean, and the other thing is, on the panel, what I'd really like to see is a radiologist or somebody that can indicate what radiation does. I have no idea. I mean, I know that it's harmful, but I don't know what it does. And I'd love to see a radiologist on board. I would love to see someone on the other side of the nuclear industry, like Artie Gunderson, who spoke and speaks on the other side of it. Some representatives that can actually tell us the other side of the story. Granted, I respect everybody on the panel. I mean, obviously, you guys are experts. But the general public doesn't understand what you guys are saying a lot of times. We're sitting there going, What's, what the heck's going on here? Because we want to know from these, these questions over here, for example, how can you guys have a nuclear facility? Then all of a sudden, it's like, well, what are we going to do with this stuff? We don't know what to do with it. Now, you're telling the general public, don't worry about it. But it's 300,000 pounds of, I, I don't know if I'm right, but I've heard that, of nuclear waste that wants to be stored with 8.5 million people I don't know, add up the numbers in regards to real estate if there's a nuclear accident. What is it, 225 billion maybe? I'm not sure. But that's just with the 10 mile radius of what the NRC says that's the evacuation zone when we know that if there's a nuclear accident, it's gonna be much wider. So thank you for everybody that's on the panel. Thank you for trying to answer some of the questions. But these questions over here are important to the public. That's, that's what we wanna hear. I've got two areas of concern that I think need addressing that I have not heard addressed. One is the earthquake safety, and I noticed from your documentation you talk about the fact that the containers are designed to withstand 1.5 G acceleration, and the requirements are right now are 0.38. Uh, 
I think that's based on old data, and that 0.38 is probably wrong because the New Zealand study has recently shown that earthquakes, even though they're separated by more than 7 to 10 kilometers, can trigger another one. In other words, it's very likely that the San Andreas Fault could very likely trigger the Newport Englewood Newport Fault at the same time. That is new information that just appeared in Science Magazine, so I don't think you're really looking at the requirements that you may need to withstand an earthquake. The second area that I've got concerned with is the 316 stainless that's the container for storage. It's well known that 316 stainless can st suffer stress corrosion cracking, and there is currently no procedure in place to look at stress corrosion cracking and study it as it's happening. Uh, looking at it with a dosimeter is uh, only a, something that you can determine after the fact, after you've had a failure. You're not, to, you're not looking at whether there's a potential for failure. If that container fails, you have no way of handling it. I think everyone looks at their stainless steel refrigerator and assumes that it's much, uh, it's a very uniform, shiny, smooth surface. But if you look at the microstructure, it's really no different than a piece of granite. It has crystals in it, they're just much smaller, and it can be subject to cracking, just like your stainless steel countertop. Thank you. And I'm really glad that somebody from the NRC is here, because when Edison applied for to the NRC and got massive emergency planning exemptions under the auspices that the plant was closed and the risk of a radiological accident was low, other than Edison making that claim, what proof or what professional risk assessment was ever conducted? On June 4th of 2015, when the NRC granted Edison massive emergency planning exemptions, what, if any, risk assessment was ever done regarding the burial of that waste on a bluff that it doesn't take a nuclear physicist to figure out is vulnerable. The California Coastal Commission, the very agency that granted that permit, is requiring the coastal communities all the way up the coast to do sea level rise studies. Del Mar finished theirs last year and recommend, one of the recommendations was to relocate the rail line. So, you know, I'm going to know exactly uh, some answers to those questions in terms of why would we even be considering putting this on a bluff that everybody knows is about to crumble? And why in God's name would you grant exemptions for emergency planning and change an emergency plan and not even talk about that in a community engagement meeting? So those are the answers that we need. Those are the questions. Thank you for your comments. Well, a lot of this has to do with uh, long-term planning that Pam raised up. The record is abysmal in long-term planning. Uh, if we go back to the last century, let's take an example. The whole nuclear industry was founded on the principle that it's all going to disappear by 1998. That was really terrible planning. And then, they, uh, and then they raised it again. Now, listening to some of these slideshows tonight, I see long-term planning. And uh, what, what's happening? There's one of the things that doesn't happen is you don't anticipate the unanticipated. Two days ago, what happened at Hanford? Oh, really? It's possible that a stupid accident like that? And then a little while ago, the gentleman from New Mexico is bragging about the WIC plant at Carlsbad, New Mexico. That's an example of a failure. The plant is closed. There were fires, explosions, radiation leaks. They spent billions of dollars trying to fix it. It's still not fixed. That's part of the problem. So if New Mexico is so expert at this, then the, 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 their record is not, is not very keen. So anybody who presents the whip as a model, forget about it. Um, another thing I don't like about anticipating the future long-range planning is the narrowing of the hazards. And we've seen almost all the discussion focus on the canisters. And I think that's Edison's agenda. But I think the, the major um, problem is probably terrorism. Anybody in a truck bomb, in a boat, cruise missile, drone, uh, Korea could fire a missile. It doesn't need to be nuclear because the nuclear stuff is already here. Uh, terrorism is a, is a real danger. And um, th if there's a radioactive plume that covers Southern California, uh, we don't care whether it was an earthquake or terrorist attack. 
or an accident or a human error or faulty uh, canisters, uh, we're going to all be irradiated. So I'd like to see this address uh, uh, these issues. Um, I, fe I support Bob Pope's uh, comment about getting smaller casts. The problem is magnified by having Edison use the 37 uh, assembly canisters. If they went back to the 24 or 22, it would cool faster, it'd be lighter, could be shipped out, everything would be easier. Yes, yes it costs more money, but let's do the right thing. Finally, we need consent-based siting. They, they brag about it in Mexico, good for you. Nobody here supports this plan. Why, doesn't, why can't we have consent-based siting and they have it in New Mexico? There is no consent. We don't want it here, let's get it out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Haddon. I'm delighted to be here in California. I'm from Texas, I work with Seed Coalition. We work with people in Texas and New Mexico. Our state agency put the quote at the top of this that they were worried about sabotage or terrorism incidents during transportation and said the uh, risks are greater than storage. So uh, our organization is opposed to consolidated interim storage. We think that a permanent repository needs to be found and a real solution, which Yucca Mountain is not. Um, and we support California moving this waste off the coast because out of every site we see, this one has huge peril of leaving it in place. However, it doesn't make sense to haul waste all around the whole country just to store it somewhere else. We need to have a real repository. And certainly, if California wanted to store it for a while somewhere, and then it could later be moved to a repository, great. But a consolidated um, interim storage means from all over the country just to store it in another location. And they're going to still keep making it. It means one more site that needs to be guarded and secured. Um, these are folks from Andrews County. They want you to know that they do not support this, and they do not want to be dumped on. Next slide. Uh, this is people at the hearing in Andrews County where Waste Control Specialists um, has, has had their offices as well as in Dallas. They say we don't want it in terms of radioactive waste. Resolutions have been passed by um, many county commissions now um, opposing high level radioactive waste dumping and transport through the communities. Bear County Commissioners in San Antonio, Dallas County Commissioners in Dallas, City of San Antonio, Midland County. Resolutions similarly have been passed by the Lone Star Chapter of Sierra Club in Texas, the Rio Grande Chapter of Sierra Club in New Mexico, and the Texas Democratic Party. This represents millions of people. We are being portrayed, next slide, uh, once more um, the message is going out, that don't dump on us, next slide. This is the DOE. Uh, who went around the whole country telling everybody that Texas and New Mexico wanted radioactive waste. And somebody earlier said, oh, well, maybe, you know, they want the money or whatever. But you know what? A few people want the money that stand to profit. And the DOE went around to Atlanta, Sacramento, Denver, Boston, Tempe, Boise, Minneapolis. And you see that big glaring hole in the middle of the country? They never set foot in Texas or New Mexico while they were trying to gain consent and we were ground zero and there was already an active NRC application on the table. This is what we think would be the radioactive waste transport routes from around the whole country. So West Texas, New Mexico could get dumped on by all U.S. reactors. Waste control wants 40,000 metric tons. I believe that Eddie Lee wants 100,000 tons. This is literally um, thousands of shipments across the whole no. country that would take 20 years. I'll wrap up. But, no, thank you for your thank you for your comments, Ray Lutz, and then Corgan Johnson. Give her a little break. Uh, Let her talk. Come on. Could, could I wrap up? I, I'm very sure. close to finishing. Wrap up. Thank you. Next slide. We're right next to the Ogallala Aquifer. Again, millions of people could become contaminated by these sites if there was a, um, a waste release. Go ahead. Extreme desert temperatures, the whole tech casts are, are rated for 101 degrees. We get up to 110. There's lightning, tornadoes, and there are earthquakes in the region. That train wreck was um, two trains head on, 65 miles per hour. Uh, this stuff is pretty risky to put on trains. Accident impacts can result in fatalities and so forth. What should be done? Don't move the waste twice. Don't use consolidated storage. Um, set a repository first. And if you set up consolidated storage, all the pressure is off for the real. I'm wrapping up. 
All the pressure would be off for a real solution, and the waste casks would bake and crack and be stuck in one site with no political pressure to ever find the right solution. We could have a massive contamination that would affect our entire country for decades and millions of years. Thank you for your comment, Ray Lutz. This is Hello panel, this is, my name is Ray Lutz, I'm with Citizens Oversight, and I have some questions first to pose. Uh, the DOE and the NRC published a generic environmental impact statement, but the concept that I understood was that it would be reviewed to make sure that it fits with local conditions. Um, has he prepared a specific environmental impact statement regarding the ISTA uh, Secondly, Palmasano says the fuel canisters can be shipped relatively right away. How much experience do we have in actually shipping these specific canisters, or is it all just theory? I note that Allison McFarland, when she was here, said it would take 45 years before the canisters could be moved. This is a critical point because it appears that the canisters do not need to cool substantially, according to Palmasano, and they could be moved immediately to a storage location if we can find it. But we need to resolve that question. Thirdly, we notice that the new SSC is located directly over the old Unit 1 reactor site. Has the radioactivity of the Unit 1 reactor been cleaned up, or is the location of the SSC a convenient way to cover up a very contaminated site? And that would explain the ridiculous place that it's being located, only 100 feet from the water. The reason it's there is probably because it's a cover-up. Thirdly, one issue with CIS is who has the liability for the waste? Because they don't want the liability, who, who has the liability? And I understand this is a key issue. Suggestion, NRC inspection report should be posted on the Songs Community website. Now, as you know, Citizens Oversight has sued the Coastal Commission and the indisputable uh, uh, additional party of Southern California Edison and where it talks about this. We do not want this site built. We looks, it looks like now it's, we're very, very close to having a solution. The fuel pools, if you ask a nuclear person are very, very safe. In fact, the nuclear plant is very, very risky, and the fuel pools, by comparison, are almost not risky at all. Thank God the nuclear plant isn't running, because that was our largest risk factor. Now we have a fuel pool, and now they're saying canisters are much safer than a fuel pool. I beg to differ, especially if you put them this close to the ocean. This is probably about the same. We're wasting money by building this big block of concrete, which then we have to treat as radioactive waste and clean up again a second time. We should wait the few years that we need to to get these other sites going. So I challenge everybody here, join with us, say no to this ridiculous place. And I say directly to Edison, you do not have to follow through on this permit. You've gotten the permit, you can say no. I realize that it's stupid what we're doing. It's insane and we're not gonna do it. It's your choice. You do not have to follow through, so don't do it. And everybody in these cities should send a letter directly to Edison and say, please don't follow through with your insane permit. It's wrong. Thank you for your comment. Torgan Johnson and then Nathan Torgan Johnson, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, almost four years ago, my wife and I invited the former Prime Minister of Japan to come to Southern California. Uh, to speak at a conference we organized, it was held down at the County Administrative Center in San Diego, we had one county supervisor uh, support that 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 uh, conference. We televised it, and uh, we had a lot of Japanese press and a lot of uh, uh, local press there. the The lessons there were from him: uh, accidents happen and plan for them. He said severe accidents happen and expect them. He also said that the fuel was the thing that he was most fearful of: losing control of the fuel. And he said that they had contingency plans in the early days of that accident to evacuate out 160 miles, not two miles or 10 miles, or like like the uh, inter inter jurisdictional planning committee has told us, you know, let's look out 10 miles and we have an ingestion zone that goes out 20 miles or 50 miles. Um, so the purpose of that conference was um, was to hear the truth about these things. I think the CEP should stand for citizens' engagement or maybe citizens' education process rather than a sales job and really kind of co-opting people from the community to sit up here and re really be over their heads on this issue. We all are. 
And uh, I, I want to say that sophomore jokes about your genitalia or, or the presence of genitalia shows me that th this is not a serious discussion. We need to bring in independent experts that can talk on this issue uh, uh, with an understanding of the severity of an accident and the consequences to the seventh largest economy in the world, which is California. A lot of it's based down here in Southern California. I think you need to engage the public. You need to engage the real risk, uh, the, the, the real uh, stakeholders in this, which are the real estate industry, the, the industry that's down the 78 corridor, uh, South Orange County, all the businesses there, and in the tourism industry here, and have them part of this discussion. Because the discussion is very different when you bring in people outside of those who are over their heads and those who are here to profit from uh, this industry one way or another. There's, there's independent thought out there, and I, I think the Prime Minister of Japan had a very clear perspective on that. He said, I almost lost Japan as a viable nation. Nobody's ever heard that before. So when we think about the fuel and, and, and really the consequences of the severe accident here, my big concern is that I'm hearing, I'm hearing people talk about saving a few million dollars. I hear kind of salesman snow jobs that really concern me. When, you, when I hear about private industry taking over fuel storage and securing fuel that's going to be, need to be babysat for 10,000 years, I, I don't even see a government that's able to do that, much less an industry that's susceptible to mergers and acquisitions. By who? And who's overseeing these companies as they morph and their liabilities morph and they, and they shift responsibility back to who? The public. I think this, this CEP panel, I know it's not a decision-making panel, and I know my time's out, but use our time wisely. Educate the elected officials on what the real issues are, what our real options are. There are not many, and at the best, they're pretty lousy. That's the truth with this fuel. Thank you for your uh, comments. And, and, and I just want to, say, want to say one thing about consent. There has never been consent in any aspect of this power plant and now the storage of the fuel is again, there's been no public consent on that outside of maybe Tim Brown. I think he's, he's the one person who consents to this. But I think outside of that, I think the rest of us are really kind of worried about what we're looking at going forward with this fuel being left on the beach indefinitely. Now that I know that you put all the uh, answers to these questions in, onto the website, I th would really appreciate your um, putting in the very, uh, a very complete report on why Yucca Mountain is not a viable place to store radioactive waste. Um, and I can provide you with lots of those reports. It's not a political thing. It's a technical thing as well. It's not uh, conducive for the, the requirements of storing radioactive waste. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is I, I want to echo everybody else's uh, comments about the lack of sincere thinking about this problem. It does, I know it, maybe that's all you're capable of. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but you're, it doesn't seem like you are thinking in terms of contingencies of um, the prior uh, problems that have occurred all over the world with, with nuclear uh, technology. It just doesn't ring true. You're, the CEP panel does not seem to be uh, grappling with reality. Uh, it would be also very helpful, I think, to have on the website um, reports of other uh, disasters that have happened and what uh, the, like, uh, for instance, the Fukushima um, disaster in Japan, there was a commission um, by the government uh, created and it said that this was a human-caused disaster because there was such collusion between industry and government beforehand to not consider the, the problems that could occur. So it would be helpful to have on your website that report, for instance, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments.